Welcome, Jeff. It's great to see you. Good to see you, Lauren. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today, and I'm really looking forward to talking about cybersecurity today. Um, I feel like this topic has, in the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, just really, just completely, it's changed, right? Like technology is changing so much, has impacted all of us in, in so many different realms, if it's technology, insurance, what have you. So before we get into all the nitty gritty of it, let's hear a little bit about your role, um, what you do on a day-to-day, -day and, and sort of set the stage there. So I'll- yeah. And the mic over to you. So yeah, yeah sure. I can so, hear more. Um, uh, J Jeff Moore, Chief Information Officer for the Belmark Financial Group. We're an independent broker dealer, uh, RA and insurance general agency. We've got about 350 producing advisors scattered across the country. And I'm responsible for technology at Belmark. Uh, and that includes cyber for uh, our home office and all of the advisors out in the field as well. So cyber, definitely near and dear to my heart uh, is, is just something, you know, we have to deal with. If you think about, you know, our, our industry, it's just mostly data, right? And uh, as the hackers have gotten more sophisticated and we've become even more connected to each other, it's just become more and more uh, important topic uh, to deal with for advisors. And can you share a little bit more about when you're looking at, I'll say tech stacks or what have you, kind of all the importance of just being safe, right? I mean, I know we talk about all different platforms from your CRM to your website to I'm sure just training and that sort of thing. I'd love to hear a little bit more about sort of the importance of cybersecurity and how you've, uh, how you all see it from a big picture. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, one of the things we require of our offices is that if they're looking at a new technology platform, cloud, whatever, uh, that we have to approve it. Right. So I get to see a lot of different, um, fintechs and what they're, what they're doing. And uh, a couple of things we look for right off the gate, or right out of the gate, is a uh, is multi-factor authentication, right? So if someone, mm -hmm. uh, whatever system they're they're using, it, it needs to have, you know, where you put in your username and password, and then you get a little push or a, a yes. text on your phone to make sure you're safe to log in. And and you'd be surprised. There's actually a number of systems that you know are in our industry uh, that don't have multi-factor authentication mm -hmm. enabled. So that would be which which you, you'd find surprising, but that's kind of like the first. Uh, the checklist. The, the other thing I, I find interesting is a lot of people, especially if they're using like a really big name brand, mm -hmm. um, it's got like all the certifications. I think just right. because they they purchase that tool, they think they're safe. And what's important to know is like, just because you're using that tool, uh, it's also about how it's configured. Mm -hmm. So you can use the big name brand two, SOC two certification, right. all the bells and whistles. Uh, but if you have it misconfigured or it's not configured correctly, uh, you know, you you could be in a lot of trouble as well. So it's 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 not just enough to have the name brand tool. You also have to have it configured correctly as well. Right. So identifying the new uh, maybe a new um, uh, tech stack to add to your portfolio or even um, it, it it might be an addition too, right? Um, so, so you're part of that process of then being able to say, okay, here's the teams, the data for their criteria, they've gotten to this point, And then you're going through the, the bells and whistles. What kind of things are you looking for? Two-factor authorization? Um, is there anything else in particular, if it's certain apps or integrations, is it, I'd love to hear a little bit more on that side of things. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, the trickiest one is typically with, when it's a startup, when it's a newer FinTech, yeah. um, I, I've seen a couple kind of like I described before, like they, they might be using Azure or Amazon AWS, they're in that platform right. and they think, oh, that's enough to be safe. But like, well, you know, it's just the tool set. You have to have it configured correctly to be safe. But I'd say the biggest thing to look out for is MFA. Uh, and then and then what kind of uh, PII or personally identifiable information is going into that system. Mm -hmm. So just being thinking really clearly about what's going into that system. And then the other thing with cloud is everything's connected, right? I'm using this system, it might connect to this other system. What data is getting shared between systems? And is there you know, private information that I have about my client that might flow into another system as well? With that, are there any kind of best practices that you've seen that are just sort of general best practices as a takeaway for even like cutting off parts of systems, right? Um, like sort of this, this group can only have access to this, information or they can have full access to this personal information for X client or what have you. I'd love to hear if there's any kind of um, kind of walls or things that you all have put into place or your lessons learned over the years when it applies to. Yeah, um, I'd say generally speaking, you should have only the permissions you need to do your job. Mm. Like, right. So sometimes I think what we see is people get over permissioned or especially somebody, maybe if they have their own their own business. Maybe they're in a role like an advisor, but they they have 
they also own the practice. So they have administrative rights to that system, right? Yeah. Well, you may feel a sense of safety, like I own that, but you actually, you might be less safe because you can accidentally do something or mm -hmm. enable some other service to have access to your system that you didn't intend to. Mm -hmm. um, I could get super technical with it and <laughs> explain maybe why, but just as a general rule, like you just want to have enough permission to just do your job kind of day to day and, and, and not give yourself any extra permissions because if your account gets compromised or, or you make a mistake inadvertently, um, yes. it's easy to do if you have too many permissions. Yes, that's that's absolutely fair. And then it creates that checks and balances for, for everything that's going on. So I'd love to hear shifting topics a little bit. And, you know, what are some of the kind of top challenges or challenges that you're seeing within the cybersecurity space? It's evolved so much over the years, right, um, to where we are today as, as has technology. And what are some of those snags that you're running into or perhaps opportunities in the market um, to uh, to help make this space even stronger? Yeah, I I think the biggest hole I see, so if we think about security or is like a chain, right? And yeah. that involves your end client, that involves the advisor, that involves the custodian, kind of the whole chain of people. I'd say right now, I feel like the weakest chain is our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think about my own mom, she's 73, God bless her. Yeah. <laughs> she's a super smart lady, right? But I have to like, you know, help her with some of her, her personal cyber. And I think a lot of advisors might work with people like her, yes. uh, right? And, 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 and oftentimes they're, they're the ones that are going to get compromised. So if, if you're, you know, you're working, if you're in a business, right, you, you're hiring smart third parties to help you consultants, et cetera, you're pretty locked down. But if your, your end client gets compromised, uh, you know, so what we could see is something like end client's email gets compromised, bad guy gets in there, he starts uh, emailing the advisor or something like that. And then the advisor wanting to, you know, give good service, be helpful to their clients yeah. inadvert inadvertently makes a mistake because, you know, maybe they didn't follow their their firm's procedures or rules, and they just didn't do the like what we call out of band um, mm. checking, right? Making sure you're checking outside of that that email that you receive that it it mm. is actually your client that's giving you some sort of instruction. Yes. The other thing the other thing we're seeing is um, the bad guys know mm. our procedures. Mm -hmm. They they know what they are with 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 firms. They're they're familiar with the types of procedures things will do. So we're seeing things like this. Um, they're very patient and they might do something like, let's say you call your, uh, your client on a certain phone number, right? Well, right, they'll, right. they'll, they'll, they'll understand that the first step they need to do is change the phone number. So they'll put in a request maybe to change their phone number, right? And then they'll wait a couple of days and then they'll send an email that says, Hey, let's do something, you know, and, and then the person calls on that number that was just changed. Well, that's not actually the client's real number. Right. They're aware of the procedure. They want to change it. So uh, it's just, it's really, I, I think that's the biggest challenge overall is just making sure is to not trust um, the client and, and have some out-of-bound verification. In fact, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article I posted about where, um, you know, people are, are, are doing the deep fakes with client voices mm. uh, to try and sound like a client when they're calling and speaking uh, to their advisor or their banks. Yeah. Um, so it's getting much more sophisticated, right? So, so having okay. some sort of mechanism uh, that, that you can share with your client, like a shared secret, like a code word or something like that, that you can put in your CRM and you can say, okay, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, what's the code word? And they can say pickle sauce and like, right. <laughs> you know, right. then you know, you're dealing with them. Yes, like that. that makes sense. I know a lot of credit cards will kind of have that, you know, a, a mm -hmm. four digit code or something of that sort. So sort of yep. similar procedures. Schwab does that with their custodian. It, that, that's, a good, that's one of my good tips is like, they don't really advertise that a whole lot, but if you want some right. extra protection on your account, um, you, you can request to use a code word with Schwab that only you know. Um, mm -hmm. So even if you enter all your information, you still have to use your secret code word uh, with them to talk to them about your account. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good tick, tip just for any of that. So um, crazy, because I think sometimes you think cybersecurity and you think it's sort of like an automated sort of thing, but they're, what you're communicating is it's becoming much more sophisticated and much more, yeah, uh, you, you, if you will. Yeah, you, yeah, and you know what? I was on another podcast with somebody, and they said, "You know what? I want with my cyber. I just want it to be something that I don't think about." And I'm like, right. "Well, actually, I kind of want the opposite. We do monthly training, and yep. the whole reason we do it monthly is because it's always got to be a little bit top For of mind." For your team, you all do. Uh, yeah. So, so okay. it kind of anybody in our network, they're getting yep. monthly training. Okay. Um, and then, and then for our developers, we even do some additional training on top of that, just mm. just to keep it top of mind and to make sure we're staying. Uh, current on on you know what's what's happening in the industry. 
Yeah, we have some firms that we work with where they do, they actually offer cybersecurity training for their clients and they'll send mm. out emails with just like reminder tips, you know, for certain times of the year or what have you. That's as awesome. Annual, um, piece, especially when you talk about the like elder abuse um, and just different folks that are not as technology, like tech savvy and even folks that are, I mean, like you're saying, it's getting more and more sophisticated. So um, yeah. interesting. So with that, is there anything that, from a kind of professional side of things, I know you said it's on the client side of things as well. Anything that you think you know, professionals should be doing to make sure that they're doing the things that they need to do to protect themselves? I mean, I guess I yeah. can from the individual professional, right? But even from like yeah. the firm level, I love to hear a little bit more on that. You mentioned trainings. Um, yeah, just yeah. things to keep yourself safe and your clients safe. So, so I, I think sometimes there's this idea that we have to do something like really kind of out there cutting edge or something right. when it comes to cybersecurity. And really a lot of times it, it comes down to just doing the boring basics, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. So it's, you know, having M first thing I talked about MFA everywhere, like make sure yes. you got MFA everywhere, whatever that means to your you know, phone app, whatever um, training we talked about. The other one that I, I think is, is starting to change. I think everybody knows they're supposed to do patching and updates, like make sure your systems mm -hmm. are updated. Mm -hmm. um, now, years ago, uh, kind of dating myself, but like 10 years ago, um, if, if you patched within, you know, nine months, 12 months, like you were fine. Like that right, was kind right. of, the, there were studies that would show that most people that were compromised, their vulnerabilities were 12 to nine months older. We're not seeing that anymore at all. Um, we're seeing a much uh, shorter time frame between uh, when a vulnerability is discovered and when someone's trying to take advantage of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, if your IT provider is coming to you and they, they're telling you they want to do some, you know, new technology to help them patch faster, that's, th that's the reason why. So, or even for yourself, right? Even on your home system, whether right. it's your, um, I, I think it was like a month ago, uh, Apple released like a, an emergency update that was basically like, you need to update your iPhone like, today. ASAP. Yes. <laughs> ASAP. And that, that was really scary and like no joke. So I think that was the biggest thing is just making sure you're doing, you know, automated updates wherever you can and, right. and, and making sure they're patched. Yeah. That, I mean, that makes sense. And then, um, are there any like tools that you see out there to help educate? So let's say, you know, you're, you're firm, you're looking to be able to educate your team about cybersecurity. Are there any kind of trainings or uh, yeah. third-party tools or things yeah. that you feel like I mean, of course there's Google, right? Which yeah, 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 the yeah, wealth of yeah. knowledge yeah. itself, but yeah. 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 Th there's a couple, I, I, I've used no before for years. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, no before. I mean, they're, they're kind of big industry player and, and I think their training is really good. It's usually very short um, and they incorporate their like phishing. Like they try to like simulate uh, an email compromise yeah. attack for you. And uh, they give you reporting on top of it. So you can see like where your firm is and then benchmark against the industry as well. So, mm -hmm. I, 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 so for specifics, that would that would be one I would I, I would look at for sure. Okay, that's great. So now I know. You, I mean, because cybersecurity is scary, right? It's a it's potentially one of the biggest threat for various companies, right? And it, 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 it can be, especially in financial services. I mean, depending on how you interact with your clients. I mean, if if you get it wrong, if you get it really, really wrong, right. um, you know, I'm I'm sure you know some people, some firms, they're they're dealing with more than a billion dollars. They may have an individual client with ten million dollars plus, um, and if somehow one of their accounts gets compromised or messed up, and somehow you get yourself in the middle of that, um, I mean, it could be it could be a death sentence. So I, I guess the other thing I would say is make sure you have cyber insurance, mm -hmm. uh, and make sure you're doing everything in the policy that that will cover and protect you. Um, mm -hmm. That would, that would be the other thing too. I think most people know that by now, but if, if you're, if you're running a business and you don't have cyber insurance and you're handling people's money, like That's absolutely need to get it. Yeah. 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 That, that falls under that blocking and you tackling. Know, yeah. I've also seen, I don't know if it's something that your firm does, but I've also seen companies where they will, um, they'll send out, I think it's through a third party tool, but they'll send out basically emails that look like they're phishing emails, but they're not really phishing emails. And mm -hmm. then you, and then individuals will get a score, like if they clicked on them or they did it and how they sort of responded to it as yeah. almost like a, it, it catch you off guard, right? Like, you know, you're not in the mindset of like taking an exam. Right. And I think that's right. kind of an interesting way to just make sure to, to remind people to keep them on their feet. Is that something yep. you all have done or? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and that no before I talked about it, it does the same thing. So yeah, really the phishing is kind of a way to like, uh, 
I'm sure you've maybe heard the phrase like trust, but verify, like, right. you know, people are training, taking the training, they're seeing it, but that's really kind of the proof in the pudding. Right. right. Uh, and, you know, I, I've certainly found that some people are better at it than others. <laughs> so we put in a couple escalation steps, that, you know, for those that might need additional training guidance, or um, if it gets really bad, uh, they get a one-on-one -on -one with me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> just, just go through the go through the basics and help you point it out. Sometimes you need that. We all need that in-person yeah. experience, you know, to, yeah. to talk yeah. to stuff sometimes. Yeah. And, and just to, to, you know, to reiterate that it's important, right? That it's mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's key. And then just out of curiosity. So, you know, we just talked about email as a platform. Are you seeing this on text messages? Are you seeing it mostly in tools like Salesforce or other things like that? Is it, you seeing it aggregated in one particular um, medium? Uh, I, I, I think from what talking to others, I think business email compromise is probably the biggest um, one of the biggest areas we see people trying to attack, especially if they're on a big platform like Office 365, right? Because they've just got millions and millions and millions of users. So uh, I guess one one tip I would have is if if you are using a system like Office 365, uh, they have their their like web version. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you're not using the web version of like you're using Outlook, uh, I would just go ahead and shut off the web version. Like just yeah. shut it off. That that's probably one of the biggest vectors uh, attackers use. Uh, mm -hmm. And and also it's not perfect, uh, but shutting down overseas access. So mm -hmm. if if you only deal with customers in the United States and there's no reason for anybody else, or you're, you don't, you don't travel internationally, you can restrict access to your account to only be logged in from. Uh, a, a United States a network. Particular. Yes. Yeah. Um, and VPNs can, they, they, they could bypass it. They could, right. they could bypass it, but you know, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised how many people still try to, you know, log in or attack uh, networks without a VPN or they're still coming from, you know, whether it's Africa, Europe, China, wherever. Wherever it could be. Yep. That's mm -hmm. fair. Um, Super fascinating. Any other tips you think would be helpful to share or kind of insights that, that you've seen over the years? Okay. If you want to get really nerdy, like if Let's you want to, like, yes. you want to really nerd out, like, okay, this thing is called a YubiKey. Okay. Tell me more. <laughs> um, so you, you have your two-factor authentication, right? So most people right. are familiar with like your phone, you get a text number or whatever. Yes. This is, this is like next level. This is like, I can't, I can't actually log into certain accounts unless I have that that this physical key present on me. So sort of um, like your government ID card, but a little bit different. That's a great way to think of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have it, it or even better because it, it's like physical. Like if I, I actually have two of them because if I lose yeah. one, like is, is game over. I can't access certain accounts. So I always right, keep right. one on me and one in another safe location mm. uh, in case something would happen. So that's like, if you really want to go next level and you like <laughs> want to protect the nuclear codes, um, you, you can yes. get what's called a YubiKey. And there's a, a number of um, uh, site, sites that support a YubiKey. That's if okay. you want to take it to the next Then level. that's something that a company would purchase. They would essentially authenticate it and they would distribute it across the board. And then that would basically be to log into your is it to your computer? Is it to Microsoft 365? It's the whole thing. You can use it for all of those. You can use it just for your laptop. It just kind of depends on where you want to configure it. Um, there, there's a lot of people that it, that'll they'll work with the YubiKey. Yeah. Uh, like uh, mostly like if you want to have like a Google login, Microsoft yeah. 365, or, um, or or like password managers or is a big one where to use it if someone's using right. a password manager. Uh, that'd be another thing I guess I hadn't talked about yet at all is making sure you use a password manager. I know a lot oh, of people- yes. No Excel, sheets, <laughs> so. no, no Excel sheets, please. No Excel sheets. And then, I, you know, I haven't dived into the um, uh, nitty gritty, but a, a lot of my friends that are bigger nerds than me in the cybersecurity space, they really recommend against um, saving your password in the browser. So like a lot of browsers will allow you to save. Uh, oh, yeah. And, 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 and most, most of them would recommend against doing that and, and yeah. use more of like an official password manager. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to be able to have that. That, that that added layer of security. I know we've worked with some companies too, where there's um, where we've you know been issued laptops and stuff. Where there's like a separate ID where you've got to log in through your phone, and it's a face verification. It's a whole thing. So um, it's just I, it's part of it, but it's a good thing. So create it is a good extra thing. layers of, of like you said. Of I, I, yeah, extra layers. Yeah, especially when you're using you know you think about the kind of data that our clients. Or, or entrusting to us, like yeah. we got to put in the extra steps. Even vendor management, I see that too. Just to throw that out there, I'm sure you all have formalities around that, and re and even issuing communications as reminders. 
um, we say that on our end too, just given the nature of our work. So. Yeah, yeah, I'd say the regulators too, or that this is definitely an area of interest for them as well. If they're asking more about is like, uh, what are firms' processes around vendors? How are you onboarding them? How are you, you know, checking to make sure that they're still doing what you think they're doing? And then how are you properly offboarding uh, vendors? Yep, makes sense. Just keep it all, keep it clean. So, well, thank you so much for your time today too. Yeah, I appreciate you course. share more. Any final thoughts? I don't want to uh, cut you off there too soon. No, I'm great. Thank you for uh, thank you for uh, letting me come on today, Lauren. It's great getting to talk to you. Oh, it's fun. It's it's a it's a great topic to talk about, and it's super important. And I think it's one of those topics where um, if you don't get ahead of it, it will get ahead of you, kind of thing. Um, and I feel like uh, you you've got to put those processes and procedures in place. And unfortunately, we see them sometimes after the fact. Um, so it's nice to have this conversation to sort of start to think about those things and identify opportunities to be able to help do that education, put those processes in place. And just also really appreciate hearing your um, expertise and lessons learned over the years. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren.